Hello, everybody. Welcome back to day two at the Design for Planet Festival. I'm Priya Prakash, your host for today, and we have a fantastic session on how to design with nature with Ihab Sayed, who's just become a doctor. So congratulations, Ihab. Thank you. Uh, just a quick note on who a bit about Ihab. Ihab Sayed is the founder and director of Innovation and Biome, board member of Fast Forward 2030, and PhD researcher, newly minted, as we know, at Northumbria University. He's a regenerative design engineer, circular, en uh, circular economy strategist, and built environment innovator with a passion of creating a biometric, which is nature-inspired circular future that meets our environmental, economic, and human needs. I'll let Nihab take on from here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Priya. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. So if you can see it full screen now. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Right. So hello, everyone. I'm Nihab Syed, founder and director of innovation at Biome, board member of Transport 2030, PhD researcher at Northumbria University. And today I'd like to talk about how we can work towards a biometric future. Now, biometrics or biomimicry as a term and as a discipline um, is something that has been quite elusive and uh, has different interpretations and definitions in the research base. When we start to look at defining biomimicry or bios life and mimicry, the act of emulation or, or copying and imitating, we start to ask some very significant uh, philosophical as well as practical questions about what we mean by nature and what we mean by mimicry. And when we begin to examine the systems around us in nature and the universe, we start to see that a lot of the uh, binaries and the boundaries that we have constructed in a very modern way of thinking are starting to be deconstructed and we're starting to see a kind of consilience or an alignment between those systems around us in the universe. And everything appears to be interconnected um, and systems appear to regulate one another through a series of feedback loops. Now that has us looking at nature slightly differently. We begin to see nature as the whole universe, as it is the place, the source, and the result of material phenomena. This includes humans, human culture, human artifacts, and the result of human activity. And with that view in mind, we begin to see that there are some um, unifying factors amongst these systems in nature where evolution is present in all systems or the creation of a new generation of an existing system through a selection process. Laws of thermodynamics are prevalent and guide and drive and um, uh, uh, all systems in the universe adhere to them. And across uh, cosmic evolution over the past 13.8 billion years or so, we can see the particular evolution emerge, followed by the galactic, stellar, planetary, chemical, biological, and then we had the cultural uh, revolution happen. And throughout all these evolutions, we're seeing that all of these systems are relying on energy. We rely on food to survive and to rely on the sun. Stars would actually implode if they had no energy running through them. And our cities and infrastructure rely on a tremendous amount of energy. Now, the notion of energy being at the heart of all things has been a romanticized notion since the beginning of time. But I think we've finally been able, through astrophysics and through the amazing work of uh, astrophysicist Eric J. Chasom, we were able to measure the uh, energy rate density or the amount of energy flowing through a mass of a system at a particular uh, interval of time. And with that in mind, let's go back to the beginning of time. So it started with a big bang on a day without yesterday. Um, and from that big bang came the four fundamental forces of nature. Those four fundamental forces of nature began to separate as a universe. Sorry to interrupt, but I think some folks, some of us are finding it a bit crackly. I don't know if it's on your side. Can I just check you how your network connection is, is working well? Just want to make sure. Yes, yeah. Um, you have full coverage? I do have full coverage, yes. Okay. It's just there's a bit of latency in your voice and the transitions, I understand, from the audience. but. 
Maybe if you sure. can turn your camera off and save some bandwidth, I don't know if that would help. Sure, yes, yeah, I'll try that. Thank you. Thanks okay. for the suggestion online, guys. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay now? It's better? Yeah. Yes. So throughout cosmic evolution, as the universe began to expand, we started to see how systems began to form in a much more complex uh, manner. We see galaxies merging and acquiring other galaxies in order to further complexify. And as we measure the energy rate density of the systems that began to emerge, we start to see some really interesting patterns. So stars emerged and they created a convection zone in the center where they created all kinds of complex compounds. They then exploded in a helpless pack of supernova. And eventually, over generations and generations, they were able to create all of the compounds uh, known to us in the, in the periodic table, all the elements are in the periodic table. And we see events really similar to what we see in our current societies, like merger and acquisition events in space. They were very chaotic at first, but they result in higher levels of order and complexity. And we start to measure the energy rate density of galaxies. We, could, we, look, we have about 0 0.1 eggs per second per gram. When we look at stars, it goes up to around 1,000, which is a very significant rise. And I want to remind us of the second law of thermodynamics. When energy changes from one form to another form or matter moves freely, entropy or disorder always increases. And I want us to keep that in mind as I go through this. So energy rate density is the amount of energy being processed by the system. And the sun has about two eggs per second per gram. We saw our bully planets, the bully other smaller pro protoplanet matter and form itself into a complex system. That's at around 10 ergs per second per gram. And then the exterior of the Earth emerged much more complex and still complexifying at 75 ergs per second. And then an incredible invention of a process known as sex was created or invented in, on planet Earth that enabled generations of evolution to happen at a faster pace than it ever has before. And that allowed plants to evolve to a level of complexity that is measured at 20,000 ergs per second per gram. Uh, fish and amphibians are slightly lower at 4,000, and, and so are reptiles. Um, and then we have mammals emerge, much more complex bodies, much more complex brains at 40,000 ergs per second per gram. And humans, slightly more efficient mammal at 20,000. But birds are the most complex organism at 90,000 ergs. And the reason for that is because they have the most complex morphology and need to have very complex brains to maneuver through all of the, um, uh, the, the kinds of all the multiple axes that they have to operate in, in space. Um, then brains emerge at 100,000 ergs and the human brain emerge holding the pinnacle of the most complex biological system at 150,000 ergs per second. And then we put our brains together and societies began to complexify further by creating cultures. And 10,000 years ago, an agricultural society, a human would consume around 100,000 ergs per second per gram. And then when we industrialized through the Industrial Revolution, we tripled our energy consumption. And as we developed more intelligent machinery and equipment, that rose to a million, a new level of complexity. And today, probably everyone listening to this uh, Zoom call and, and, and everyone in uh, a modern developed uh, society um, uses around 2 million ergs per second per gram. Um, and our AI technologies are even rising to higher levels uh, or orders of magnitude at 10 million ergs per second per gram. What this really tells us is throughout the story of evolution, systems are adhering to the laws of thermodynamics and adhering to the cybernetics of their environments. And they are complexifying and evolving at a rate that has accelerated significantly since humankind and reached completely new orders of magnitude that are unprecedented. And the way we've managed to reach that is because we have been able to um, practice the process of reflexivity in a very conscious manner, unlike other species in, on our planet. And reflexivity is a system's ability to examine its environment and itself, reflect on the laws, principles, and behaviors that govern it, and react as a result. The ability to reflect on the past and the present to inform the future. 
And I think this is something that is really interesting because earlier in our uh, evolutions as a species, we were very much in tune and reflexive when it comes to natural systems around us. But our cultural systems are currently the, the most significant factor or driver in our thinking, and we're neglecting the natural systems. And this became especially problematic when we found this gold mine of energy, fossil fuels, that enabled us to complexify or maladapt in a very significant manner. And bringing back the second law of thermodynamics, where disorder always increases when energy is transformed, we're transforming significant amounts of energy and creating order in our world with cultural, social, and economic systems. And as a result, we are creating incredible energy, uh, inequitable energy distribution, which correlates with inequitable social, wealth, and resource distributions around the planet. And the pandemic and the climate crisis that we're seeing, these are all arguably nothing but ripples of the economic and cultural systems that we have developed and created that tend to focus more on our constructs and value systems rather than adhering to the natural systems that we're very much a part of. And we're going to continue to grow uh, in, in the next few decades quite significantly. Um, and the uh, planetary boundaries, we've already exceeded five of the nine planetary boundary, boundaries. More, most recently, we've just exceeded the fifth one. So we're at a stage where we can see that we will need to continue complexifying, but the amount of energy that we're using and the source of energy that we're using is having an incredibly destabilizing impact on our planet. And therefore, and by, as biome, we would like to redefine or expand the definition of biometrics or biomimicry to the holistic and systemic emulation of the multitudinous hierarchical systems in nature to create intelligent solutions that are globally situated, socially connected, and sensitive to the cybernetics and energetics of their environment. In short, to master the reflexivity of life. And that is exactly what we do at Biome. Biome is a multi award winning research and development led company that places biological systems at the heart of its inspiration to revolutionize construction and demonstrate a completely new uh, uh, evolutionary path for humanity. Um, our philosophy that drives us is very simple it's one that allows nature to lead innovation and only have a positive and, in, and a regenerative impact on everything that we touch. And that is manifested throughout all of our product offerings uh, from construction systems uh, through to uh, bio-based materials and technologies, uh, as well as um, a range of services that we offer. I'm going to just start with looking at our bio-based materials and particularly mycelium or the root structure of fungi. And we work with living organisms. We are able to communicate with them and train them to consume uh, different resources that are problematic in our economy. So we take fungi from um, the wild and we are able to then train them through a program where they can consume different waste streams and produce materials with better properties. And a great example of that is our building insulation made out of mycelium or fungi. Uh, which is currently outperforming multiple uh, market alternatives and it's a completely natural bio-based product. We've also got an acoustic range using the same technology, uh, as well as all kinds of artwork and one-off uh, implementations of technologies that we can use. Um, and our approach is to find uh, the best way to demonstrate synthetic and high-performing uh, materials properties using only natural uh, technologies without additives or chemicals or coatings that are harmful for the environment. And the way that we're doing that is practicing a deeply biomimetic and systemic perspective where we are always considering all of the different possible impacts that our products or our technologies that we develop and could have throughout their lifetime as well as at their life cycle boundary where they then uh, begin a new life. And throughout our developments, we were able to evolve our strains in miraculous ways to where we now have four strains that can consume plastics, uh, polyethylene and polyurethane. Uh, and we're evolving those further uh, uh, alongside the healthcare sector because the outcomes of these processes are additives to drug discovery uh, programs uh, and, and other technologies and pharmaceutical uh, industries. 
Another technology we work with is Orb or Organic Refuse Bio Compound, and it is a, a material made um, entirely out of food or agricultural uh, waste stream. And we're able to create uh, construction board sheet material as well as uh, uh, lighting or lampshades. You can see our obscure lampshades here. Um, and these are made entirely from uh, orange peel or coffee chaff. Um, and both are problematic waste streams as they're too acidic for anaerobic digestion or, or, or landfill. Um, and so we find uh, a really positive way of fitting out a building with a product that is carbon negative. Every lampshade uh, uses at least 1.5 kilograms of, of carbon and three kilograms of waste. And that by fitting out a building with these lampshades, for example, or these products, you're able to decarbonize your uh, real estate by simply integrating biometric design into um, uh, the, the building. And here's just uh, uh, an example of where we've installed these lampshades at Gale Bakery and the Pristy restaurant, as well as lots of offices and co-working spaces in London. Um, and this is an old tile, uh, same material, same technology, but we've evolved it a little without uh, requiring a binder. So this is 100% orange peel, and it's only our manufacturing process and the science behind the process that enables the material to bind to itself. So this is where we're actually utilizing the binding, the binding agents that already exist in the waste streams that we are using. So uh, just going to quickly talk about our R&D services and how this really translates into practically supporting the industry. Here you can see soil that we took from a construction site and turned into a material that was then put back into the same uh, development uh, in the form of lampshade uh, and furniture and, and, and different pieces of products. Here at Glyndebourne uh, Opera Pavilion, uh, it's a new pavilion they're designing. We use their main waste streams, which are champagne cork bottles. Uh, and grass trimmings from the, 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 their large fields and created new materials that can be used on the walls. Here we worked with the Green Salon Collective where we took human hair and created mats as well as other foam materials. Um, and we worked with one of the largest property development firms to look at the most problematic waste streams in the industry. And we're able to create materials that actually outperformed uh, the top right one, for example, is a cardboard material that outperforms plywood, which is widely used in the industry. And this is an example of the micro-remediation or the plastic remediation uh, strains that we have. We worked with Bupa to take uh, masks and gloves from care homes to then install them into, uh, sorry, to then inoculate them with our strains and uh, actually consume them. And we were able to see incredible results within only a month uh, of degradation. Um, and I think, that brings me towards the end of my examples and really what we're driving for at Biome and through my personal research is a drive towards a biometric future. One that appreciates humanity's evolutionary story as much as other inhabitants on the planet's evolutionary story. And we must be able to put an equal amount of value on our complexification and development as well as the other species that we share this planet with. And this biometric perspective is one that will enable us to hopefully realign our natural and our cultural systems so that we can continue to coexist on this beautiful planet. And that brings me to the end of my presentation and apologies about the um, signal. I hope you were able to hear the rest okay. Thank you so much, Ihab. That was so, so interesting. Just love the orange peel example and the other ones you shared. It's uh, just following some of the comments online. People are getting so much of hope and inspiration because it's very oh, rare amazing. to see this. Um, there are some questions coming up. One from David B, which I can see here. What are the implications if bioconsuming organisms are released into the environment and consume things that are unintended? And this yes. is the unintended consequences. That'll be brilliant, yeah, to share. It's an excellent question. And I think um, regardless of whether a species has been uh, evolved in a lab or not, I think we have to be very mindful of introducing invasive species in places that they're not supposed to be. So, for example, um, uh, when it comes to our processes and our production uh, facilities, 
uh, we uh, the material when it leaves our facility is always uh, inert. It's a completely kind of dead foam-like material. Um, and we make sure that all of our processes are incredibly secure and safe so that the, the strains don't escape. The reality is we only work with strains and species that are local to where we are, so that in the event of those strains or species escaping, it's not an issue. Um, another thing that is very reassuring is fungi is very lazy. So if we develop an incredible fungi that can consume all these plastics, and we don't use any genetic uh, engineering, by the way, we, we only use directed evolution to evolve these strains. Um, if they do, if we do develop this amazing uh, plast plastic-consumed fungi and escapes and it uh, finds itself in the forest, it will go back to eating leaves and trees and simple things because it's much easier uh, than producing these complex enzymes to, to break down the plastics. We do see it happen in nature near landfills where there's leeches and plastic and the fungi actually begins to consume it naturally and begins to develop that, um, uh, those enzymes naturally. That actually talking about fungi, we have a question from Chloe uh, from Materialized Interiors here. Mm -hmm. Hello, Ihab, how is testing of your mycelium insulation progressing? How long to market? Yes. Thanks for asking. I think it's been a, a long awaited wait <laughs> and it seems to keep extending. Um, I think the, the construction industry is incredibly stringent and it's a very uh, uh, challenging thing to take a bio-based material uh, into an industry that's dominated by uh, standards that are created for plastic and synthetic materials. So we had a huge challenge, almost two years of um, just trying to figure out which is the best standard to test our material against. And we ended up having to find the European standard that is for animal and vegetable derived uh, fibrous insulation. Um, and that was the kind of closest thing we could find. And from that point onwards, it's been two years or so of us actually going through the process of testing and um, providing the appropriate samples or a testing body. And we're in the final stages now. So we're fingers crossed by June, July next year, we should have the product launched in small quantities and by the end of next year we should have the first large-scale facilities coming into operation so we're, we're almost there <laughs> but it's been a long and difficult journey yeah i guess uh, doing things like this for the first time many of you are pioneers in this space so obviously you know you're kind of creating the steps for many others like us to follow so thanks for that persevering uh, oh, absolutely yes uh, Silas has a question as well here. Silas Gibbons, I love the notion of reflexivity. What are people saying when you approach them with these materials? And what are your biggest challenges? Right. Well, I think five years ago, um, we would uh, probably be a kind of um, assumed or boxed or pigeonholed into a kind of group of uh, hippies and that are trying to change the world and are really passionate, but these materials will never achieve the kinds of synthetic and plastic uh, performance that we have in the industry. Uh, what we're seeing since the pandemic in particular and in the last couple of years is an influx of major, major giant brands and giant organizations uh, really trying their best to decarbonize their supply chains and their approaches. So we are currently inundated with uh, interest and uh, fascination in our materials and wanting to use these at scale to actually replace a lot of the, the industry's materials. And they've got so many active live projects at the moment which are not necessarily looking at our product portfolio, but are looking at the supply chains of organizations and finding uh, ways of picking out the waste streams that would be perfect for um, material production, as well as the waste streams that have the highest amount of carbon and that are the most problematic, and turning those into materials they can uh, that they can funnel right back into their developments. So I think that is where it gets really excited because we're providing the full circular offering and you're cutting carbon on both sides of the supply chain from the supply and from the sale, uh, the sale of products as well. Great, we have only one minute left and we still have some brilliant questions here online. I'm trying to see how to pick one that this uh, Paul Smith again from the construction uh, industry and he also mentions here, great talk, thank you, like the construction work. I worry that sustainability is exclusive and can't scale to areas of greatest need. For example, could using construction waste to manufacture interior products work at the social housing scale? So, and there's another one also about um, a similar question around construction. So your construction industry questions. Sorry, I'm muted. 
Um, one, one really important thing for us is that our materials and products from day one um, are developed in a way that enables their affordability. We never wanted to create something that is a premium uh, because of the size of the challenge that we're trying to uh, address with the climate crisis at the moment. We wanted to make sure that there's maximum impact. So not only are our products and materials completely universal in that you can go anywhere in the world and create these products as a commodity for a community to benefit from, um, but also all of the, um, uh, the, the products and the technologies that we create we uh, design in a way so that in two or three years of launching, they are at the mid to the lowest end of the price point in the market. Um, so yes, it would absolutely be suitable for social housing. The process of accrediting uh, new waste streams into our product and material is something that is a one-off cost. And once that cost is taken care of for a waste stream, it's, um, it's completely not a problem from that point onwards. I think that also covered Katya Shavrina's question as well in terms of retrofitting on the UK residential stock. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. we're running out of time, but there's one great question from Nicole Lozer. She's asking about your team, how big it is, and how many disciplines are working together. I was putting the link for Neri Studio as well, so there's lots of curiosity about your team and disciplines involved. Absolutely, yes. I think uh, for us, we take a very transdisciplinary approach, which is kind of the next step up from interdisciplinary where we do have people with different specialisms and different uh, disciplines from sciences, humanities and business and so on. Um, but they, we're always working together. There's always an engineer, scientist, designer, um, and not just a scientist, a biologist and a chemist on every single project that we work on, mm -hmm. uh, ensuring this kind of multi-perspective approach, as well as having a very clear commercial and legal perspective on things from the very start as well. So our team is about 20 or so at the moment, 22, 23. Um, and hopefully within the next year, we're looking to potentially double the team, which is gonna be a, an interesting move. Um, but we're, we're at a stage where we're growing quite quickly at the moment, which is really exciting. And it's about building, um, right now we've got the kind of chemists, biologists, designers, engineers, and it's about building the kind of more, more specialized uh, versions of those. So looking at synthetic biology, looking at parametric design, uh, AI and artificial intelligence. I think that's the the, the expansion plan. <laughs> Great. With that note, we're going to thank you for sharing your work and inspiring so much of us on the first how to talk for day two. Ausla, mm -hmm. lastly, how do people contact you? Is there a link or online sure, um, yes. um, emails if... you could share with the chat? That would be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. Brilliant. Thanks, everyone. We're going to move to the next webinar. And thank you, Ihab. This is truly inspiring. All the best with the next steps. Thank you so much, Priya. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Bye-bye.